Welcome to Haunt Topic Radio, the podcast for haunters by haunters. These are our scary visions. Just a few months before haunt season. Are you ready? In this podcast episode, we get Leonard pickled on from Hauntrepreneurs.com. Leonard has done classes for us in the past. This one's all about designing your haunted attraction to be accessible for people with disabilities. ADA compliance. Now, some areas may not require you to be as detailed as this masterclass is. Some like if you have a ramp and everything's wide enough, you're good. But Leonard gets into specifics about things you should think about when you design your attraction. Because I think a lot of haunts aren't ADA accessible. And I know when we built the Dead Factory, we made it accessible. And the amount of people that called us up and says, you guys allow wheelchairs? And we're like, yeah. Oh my goodness, we haven't been to a haunted attraction in years. Just for that reason. So if you can build everything three feet wide and have ramps and handicap accessible outhouses and bathrooms, that's one thing. But there's also smaller details you need to think about. We also want to invite you over to HauntersToolbox.com. There will be some changes to our membership site coming up in the next few weeks. Also, the price will go up because we're adding a bunch of other classes and benefits to our membership. So if you want to get on the haunt train, now's a good time. We'll keep you updated on that as, as we get a little bit closer. Well, if you're in the stages of designing your haunt or building your haunt, most of you are probably in scare actor hiring and getting ready to do some training by now. So stay tuned. We'll be having some more cool podcasts come up. Well, let's roll into it. Let's talk to Leonard Pickle about ADA design and compliance. We have Leonard Pickle on tonight from entrepreneurs.com. Leonard has done several classes for us on design and truth about haunting and how to build your haunt. Tap full of wisdom. He's here to share some more of it tonight. We're going to be talking about codes and compliance and ADA and handicap accessibility, all that stuff that Leonard thinks is dry, but I don't see a lot of it being talked about. So this is a thing that we really didn't know when we're building and designing and we want to get it right once. We don't want to have to do it again. I don't never like rebuilding anything or what well, they say, measure twice, cut once. Yeah. So. I cut that board off twice and it's still too short. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. Been there. <laughs> so knowing, knowing all your widths and your heights and your slopes and your whatever we didn't need to know, I'm sure this will be the man to ask. So Leonard, um, for those people that don't know you, just a short, how long you been in the industry and what are you doing today? I built my first haunted house in 1976 in a college dormitory. Uh, we thought we were going to make enough money to for a, for, have a beer party, and it was open for two nights. We charged 50 cents a head, and when everything was all said and done, we had about two grand in the in the kitty, and it was something that you know I really really enjoyed. I was studying to be an architect at the time, and, and once I graduated with my degree and started apprenticing in Dallas, I volunteered with the March of Dimes and chaired their event for four or five years before I did my own. My first haunted house was literally built on credit cards and pocket change. And, you know, when everything was said and done, I took all the money that I made and tried to pay off the all my credit card bills. And I was about $20,000 in debt, which I thought was a huge failure, not realizing that a haunted house is a business just like any other. It's a three to five year payout. You're not, you're not, it's not, get, not a get rich quick scheme by any shape of the imagination. So uh, I went off and tried to uh, figure out, you know, now that I'd started a business, I thought that maybe I should take a class on how to start a business. Um, took a class with a, with a uh, community college and the, the guy at the front of the room told me, you know, I sat back in horror as a guy at the front of the room told me everything that you should not do, like use credit cards to start your business and, you know, max yourself out to the hilt and all, all the stuff that I had done. Uh, and one of the things he, he did say is that if you're going to, if you're going to be, if you're going to start a business, you should be an expert in your field. And how do you become an expert in your field? Well, you write a book. So I wrote the three little room design booklets and, and published those. And that turned into a newsletter uh, that turned into Haunted Attraction Magazine, uh, which we ran for 50 issues. And then uh, that turned into uh, um, Haunt Con, which we ran for I don't know another 15 years or so, and and uh, and now I'm just a consultant. I I uh, my dad when when I was 
first doing the haunted houses, he kept, you know, saying that, telling me that uh, haunted houses are very risky, but it, I had so many people coming to me wanting me to design haunted houses for them that I turned that into a business. I would have been, I would be much richer than I am right now if I had step, kept doing my own haunted houses instead of doing them for other people. But, uh, but it's something that I've been able to turn my architectural degree, degree into, into something that I've, you know, been doing for over 40 years now. So, um, so it's, uh, you know, something that gets me out of bed every morning and that I enjoy doing. And I've done haunts all over the country and around the world, really. And, uh, yeah, well, I still still love doing it. Yeah, you live in the dream, man. That's what it's <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> so what are you going to talk about tonight? What What is... Um... Well, we I was about. listening to a podcast. I don't know if it was the last one you did or not, but I was listening to one of your podcasts. I'm I'm a faithful member of the uh, Toolbox on a Toolbox, and I was listening to one of your podcasts. And during one of the conversations, you said, "Oh, you know, we need we I don't know anything about handicap codes. We need we need to get somebody to do a seminar on handicap codes." It's just like I've done that before, but um, so I I told you that I would do it, and then I started looking at the one that I've done before, and it was pretty light. So I've gone back through and. Looked at the new code, the the code, the the ADA code that they're doing now is a 2010 version, um, and uh, it's changed slightly, not a lot, but it's changed a little bit from from when I did that first uh, seminar, and so I just beefed it up, and and uh, so we're going to talk about you know things that could certainly come back to bite you, you know, when you're doing your uh, either when you're putting your uh, drawings to the city. Uh, for your attraction, making sure your training radiuses are proper for a handicap, um, making sure your hallway widths are, are proper and that kind of stuff to make sure that, you know, and some people, there are a lot of municipalities that the fire marshal and building department either don't have jurisdiction or they just say, go build it and we'll come look at it later. The problem with that is you build it and they come out and say, oh, these, these hallways aren't wide enough. That's a disaster because it's not like you can just slide one over and, you know, give it some more room. So, so you want to do everything on paper and get the building department, fire department to sign off on it before you ever drive a nail. It's a whole lot easier to change it on paper than it is to do it when you're after it's it's already built. So uh, so yeah, we're just going to talk about uh, covering the aspect and you know and, and the the ADA code is really it doesn't really have any anything to do with building code and it doesn't really have anything to do with with fire code. It's a law that was passed by Congress. Uh, 198, uh, or sorry, 18, 1990. And, uh, and it, it has teeth. You know, if, if you're, if you're in violation of the building or fire code, they'll close you down. But if you do something, if you make something that's inaccessible and somebody that's, you know, that, that's in a wheelchair or, or some kind of, or is, is disabled and is trying to, to visit your event, not only can you be fined for that cash money, but they can sue you. They can personally sue you, sue you for, uh, for the violation. In fact, when when they first passed the ADA code, I remember there being a, a a local architect in town that was wheelchair bound, and he would go around to restaurants and and you know go in and realize that they weren't accessible, and he he'd tell the guy, "Hey, here's your choice: you can hire me to to redesign this and fix it, or I can sue you. You know, you let me know." So it it really was something that came down like a ton of bricks. In fact, you know, there's a there's a a, a massive cavern in uh, New Mexico called Carlsbad Caverns, and because it's a national uh, park, they in the national parks have to be handicap accessible. They went through that thing with a bulldozer and tore out rock formations that had been there for a thousand years just so that they could make the the path down down into the cave uh, accessible you know, and up to the codes that we're getting ready to talk about, you know, which is a travesty. It, you know, it even had an elevator. There was an elevator. You go down, the, you go in the mouth of the cave and go down into the bottom of the, into the deepest part of it. And then you ride an elevator out. I mean, they certainly could have put people on an elevator and brought them down in and, and they could have seen almost everything you could see riding, you know, walking in. But it didn't matter. They just went in there and ripped everything out to, to make it handicap accessible, which is a huge travesty. Um, so, you know, these people are serious. Uh, so when you're thinking about doing a haunt, make sure that you know the codes uh, because it, it can really come come around to bite you. Be careful. Okay. Well, let's. Um, I'm gonna minimize my screen, or I'm gonna log off of here. My camera and let you take over. Okay. Sounds good. I think Scarret badges are one of the smartest things I've seen in the industry in a really long time. Scarret badges are basically either pins or embroidered patches, uh, kind of like merit badges, as they are, you know, somewhat named after, from Boy Scouts and, and Girl Scouts and Brownies, and where after you've accomplished something, you can wear the brag tag of 
the embroidered patch. Some haunts put them on jackets, some put them on t-shirts, some put them on uh, with the pins. I've seen them put them on lanyards. But the neat thing about them is they are very specific in what they are rewarding. And they're haunt-based images that reflect what's being rewarded. It's retention, it is bringing people back, and it's actually giving your haunters, your haunt performers, the ability to share that they are haunt performers. And, oh really, you're a, you're a scare actor. Where do you do that? And then they will insert the name of your haunt right there. So it's also marketing. I've always been a big fan of Scarret Badges. I think they're great. So check them out, scarretbadges.com. No, it is, that is not a paid advertisement. That is just my recommendation. I think it's really cool. ScottSwinson.com Just a reminder, folks, as uh, we're starting this show, if you do have any questions, post, post them over in the chat box and we will get to them uh, in a timely manner. OK, thanks. So as I was saying, this the ADA was passed in 1990 uh, and it requires that all public accommodations provide equal access. And that means haunted houses, haunted trails, haunted hayrides. Everything has to be accessible. You know, one of the, the big problems that they have at amusement parks is, you know, and you'll, and you'll see that sometimes when you're riding rides that they, um, um, they'll have one special car that has a way to lock a wheelchair down into it so that um, so the people that are disabled you know, mobily um, can, can also experience the ride. And, and the, the, you're really, by code, by the letter of the law, you're not allowed to change their experience. Uh, we'll get into, we can talk about, uh, you know, handicap bypass later, but, but the reality is that you're supposed to be able, you're, whatever you're doing, whatever the experience is for people going through it, it's supposed to be the same, whether they're, you know, disabled or not. Um, you know, and, and when it, when you talk about, uh, uh, ADA, you know, everybody's really familiar with wheelchair access, you know, making sure that the ramps are correct and all that kind of stuff, but it's not just a wheelchair, it's a walker. It's a cane, it's crutches, it's, it's all kinds of different uh, situations where you might be mobily challenged. Now, you don't have to write, you don't have to build your haunted house so that some, you know, somebody can come in with, a, with a, uh, an electric wheelchair. Um, but you do need to think about um, being able to uh, allow people, allow for people being, uh, to be able to, to, to traverse your, your attraction, um, uh, at least in a, in a, in a typical, in a, you know, typical uh, hospital style wheelchair. You know, most people that are in wheelchairs uh, every day, they've got, you know, they, they've got the slim down version. It's narrow, it's small, it's light so that they can you know, wheel around in it all day long. Um, and you, but you, you don't have to let the rascal, you know, the big motorized electric wheelchairs through your haunt. That is not a requirement. Uh, although, um, you know, obesity is not on this list, but um, it's quite possible that it will be eventually. Uh, in fact, by the definition, it, it, it may already be included. It's, um, you know, so when you're, you're thinking about doing, doing your attraction, you have to think about, you know, what, how does a deaf person or somebody has a lot of uh, really bad hearing loss, how do they experience the attraction? So if you've got rules or something on a video, you, you have to, the, you need to put the closed captioning on because mm -hmm. there's no, there's no way that they're going to be able to understand what's going on if they can't hear the video. Leonard, so, yep. I think you're the, the view that I'm getting of the presentation is the last page. Still? Yes. Yeah, so I don't know if you have maybe two screens open or uh, I, don't know that, I don't know if that's the way with everybody else. Does anyone, anyone else see the I was getting the um, the last because you were talking about a list and I was seeing the last area. I guess I've got two screens open. This should be that's showing is that because it looks like there's only one slide up there. That. So I know we tested this before we got on, so I don't know what's going on. It's the goblin. The goblin's taking over. Got too much crap open for one thing. Please stand by. Technical difficulties. So is that the list? Are yeah, you seeing now, it? Yeah, yep, now I see okay. American ADA. Yep. Sorry. Yep. That's okay. roll on. That's fine. So it's not just somebody in a wheelchair. Uh, somebody's deaf. Somebody's blind. So if, if you know you you have some kind of printed material that has something to do that they're supposed to sign or something. You know, like a, a waiver or something. You have to provide that in either Braille or in some kind of a recorded fashion so that they can they can listen to it. You know, and this is and this is right off the thing. This is some of the stuff that's changed on on the, the ADA code from what I what I remember it. I mean, major depressive disorder. So if somebody's depressed, you have to do something to you know to uh, allow them to be able to go through your haunted house just like anybody else would. I don't know how cancer and diabetes. I mean, that that's a mobile. Uh, um, mobile thing so maybe that's a wheelchair hiv yeah i don't know how how these you know are just dis disabilities 
I mean, I get their mental disabilities. They're not physical disabilities. So it's um, it's getting weird out there. Um, and, you know, these are the kind of things that are coming down the pike. And, 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 and there are people that are doing, uh, you know, tours that are that have got the music turned off and their lights, light scares or no actors and that kind of stuff, it's especially for people that are, you know, autistic or, you know, somebody that are that are easily freaked out by loud noises and stuff, which I don't know why they're going to a haunted house, but, um, but those are the things that are, that's kind of coming down the pike, you know, and, and this is not a, it's not a complete list. This ADA protects any impairment that significantly affects major life activities, such as learning, communicating, seeing, caring for oneself, sleeping, and so on. So, and it includes cognitive disabilities. Um, they're all, they all fall into this act and, and that's going to, if they start, you know, being strict about this stuff, that's really going to affect the haunted house industry, you know, in ways that we can't even imagine right now. You know, so when you're thinking about designing your, your haunted house, you know, the first thing you got to do is read the book. You know, then there's, this is a link that'll take you right to the, the page that's got the entire law. Uh, it's written out. It's on the website. Um, they're currently, they're doing the, the 2020 uh, version of, of the, of the lawsuit or the, of the, of the law, I guess it's just a, law, a written law, um, you know, but, but so you can, so, I mean, you need to read it. I mean, you look through it, um, figure out what, what apl- applies to you and what doesn't. Uh, this is, you know, this is going to be a, a, a good overview for you. Um, but, you know, you, you can't win the game if you don't know the rules. And so you got to play, the, if you want to play the game, you need to learn the rules. Um, make sure you plan ahead. Um, you know, this is something that could really bite you in the end if you if uh, your hallways were too narrow or if your turn radiuses were too short. There's stuff that, that could really uh, put you in a bad way, you know, when you're trying to get open. If you don't um, think about it ahead of time and make sure that your plans are ADA accessible, make sure that the, the dimensions and the hallway widths and that kind of stuff are, are proper so that you can um, so that you can do this. Um, use technology to your advantage. We we did a haunted house, a little haunted house at a um, uh, at a horror con not too long ago. And uh, the, the city of Orange or the, the county, Orange County, uh, which is where Orlando is, they are really hard to on haunted house people they they have they are notoriously savage on those kind of people and we set this haunted house up and, and they wanted us to have you know something so that if the smoke detectors went off it shut down all of the attraction and what we used was a uh, a gadget that was invented to put to plug your stove into so that in the event that you're not even there and there's a some you, if you left the house for some reason and there was something boiling or cooking in the stove or something and it caught fire the smoke detector would sound and would make an audible noise, and the audible noise would then trigger the um, the the stove, the, the, this this gadget that you put on the stove to shut everything off. And so we utilize that um, to be able to to open that attraction in a, in a ballroom uh, at a convention um, a year ago. And you know, so use technology to your advantage. There's all kinds of Bluetooth and other kind of stuff that's going on uh, out there that you can utilize to be able to 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 make this uh, make this easier. Another thing you need to think about is light on the floor. Um, you know, it's really hard to make a haunted house di- uh, dark and, and and still make it to where people can get through it easily by seeing um, seeing where they're supposed to be going. But if you if you can light the floor, make the make your floor light, you know, paint it a color that's light or put some light carpet in it or something, and then make sure that there's light on the floor. That's going to help people be able to traverse something. It's going to keep people from tripping over stuff or, or in corners of doors and that kind of stuff if they can see it. They can't see the floor. It's going to slow down your capacity anyway. So you want a light floor to begin with. Um, and then offering alternatives, uh, alternative tours so that you can, um, you know, invite people in that are disabled uh, or and, you know, t- tone down the music, tone down the lighting or bring up the lighting or tone down the scares and that kind of stuff. You know, there's several haunts that I know of that are that are all, that are offering these, um, you know, lack of sensory overload uh, tours uh, for people to go through. And, you know, we, I did this a long time ago just by accident. There were, we were building a haunted house at a mall one time. And these ladies pushing shopping cart, or pushing uh, baby cart uh, carriages were, were um, strollers were, were, you know, came up and says, hey, can we go through? And we said, sure. And we just be careful. And, and so they went through the attraction and said, hey, you should charge people to go through this with the lights on. It looks so cool. You know, so, I mean, we've kind of we kind of did that by accident a long time ago. But that's an option, too, for you to be able to, to do something that that would um, allow people that that wouldn't even be able to go through, you know, with the lights off and the actors in place to be able to experience your haunt. You know, and if you can arrange it with 
you know, some kind of a, a group of those people. I mean, it's, it's some, some money you can do it off hours or off days so that it's not hurting your, your uh, regular um, attendance. Do you know what causes haunted attractions to shut down before they even get started? The top three roadblocks are lack of funding, lack of leadership, lack of resources. As a member of the Haunters Toolbox, you get instant access to the tools you need to start and grow your own haunted attraction business. To get started, become a member at HauntersToolbox.com. So the first thing that people talk about, I mean, probably the thing that affects most people um, on a daily basis is parking. Um, the the uh, disability, the, the ADA parking spaces are supposed to be the, sh the closest to the main entrance of the building. Uh, the main entrance of the building does have to be accessible. When the code first came out, they just allowed, they told you that just as long as you had one entrance to the, the building that was accessible, that was that was okay. They've changed that now. The main entrance to the building, to the, to the business, has to be uh, accessible. Um, and then one parking space uh, for every 25 parking spaces has to be uh, an accessible parking space. Uh, and you have to have at least one. So even if you have fewer than 25 spaces, you still have to have at least one parking space, which makes me wonder if you've only got one parking space for your business, then that has to be a handicapped accessible parking space. And you can't park there unless you have a, unless you have a, uh, a license plate, an ADA license plate, which makes, makes it difficult. But, um, um, but one for every 25 and um, and then at least but at least one even even if you have less than 25 um, total spaces. Um, there's a lot of, of um, code about ADA code about toilet compartments. You have to have at least one for every restroom. Um, if you have more than six fixtures, more than you know, you count up the, the toilets and the, and the um, urinals. If there's more than six of those total, then you'd have to have a second um, handicap accessible um toilet uh, enclosure um the um if you have one or more one uh, more than one urinal then one of them has to be lowered uh to to the to the code um where you have more than where laboratories are, are uh, provided one of them has to at least one of them has to allow for a wheelchair to go underneath it and still be utilized so it's a lower uh, cabinet height um, cabinet top height uh, and you have to make sure that it's clear so that the wheelchair can go underneath it uh, and you have to be careful about the uh, the hot water in, in the drain so that to make sure that um, you know, if you had really hot water for some reason which I don't know why you would but if you had really hot water underneath there and you didn't insulate those lines you could burn somebody that really badly that didn't have any feeling in their legs. Um, so they, they are, they're big on making sure that all that stuff is insulated. And if you ever, if you've ever been in a bathroom, it's got it. You'll, you can look around and see these kind of things where how people have handled them, um, uh, especially in like in an airport or some large building. Uh, you'll always see that kind of stuff and how they how they both the drain lines and the hot water need to be uh, insulated. Um, if you've got a if you've got a mirror in your bathroom, then then at least one of them needs to be tilted slightly down so that a wheelchair can see himself. And there's all kinds of of high requirements and dimensions for grab bars and toilets and that kind of stuff. And I didn't go into all that stuff on here just because it's very complicated. And, and typically that would be something that is, you know, in the bill, if you're in a building uh, that you didn't build, um, you, you might have to renovate it to make it, bring it up to code. But hopefully all that stuff is, is done and is ready to go so that you don't have to worry about that in, in your building. Um, any signage, any required signage has to be um, both in relief and in Braille. So it has to be like a raised symbol um, so that, that people that can't see or can't see well know kind of what that is. It has to be placed 40 inches above the floor. Um, you know, in a situation where, I mean, some stuff is really hard to do in Braille, you could do, you could certainly do something that was an audio recording versus Braille. Uh, and if you've got some kind of a, you know, some kind of a video, then you're going to have to do some kind of closed captioning rather than, or, or you're going to have to have printed text. If, you, if you've got some speech or the rules or something at the beginning of your haunt, then uh, you should at least have some kind of a printed material where you can hand it to somebody that's that's hearing impaired. Uh, if you've got a video, then make sure that it's got uh, closed captioning to be able to do that. Um, the other uh, interesting thing that's in it's in the ADA code is that it talks about you know, the surface, you know, and it says floor and ground surfaces shall be stable, firm, and slip resistant. You know, and it says ground, you know, but dirt or gravel is not considered a uh, an accessible surface, which means that every haunted trail that I've ever been to, or or haunted corn maze, or corn maze at all for that matter, 
is not handicap accessible by code. I've never heard of anybody you know, complaining about it or having a problem with it. Um, but what they're basically telling us is that it's got to be, you know, asphalt or concrete or something, uh, some kind of material that is slip resistant and firm, none of which dirt or gravel would be. Um, so that that's one of those things that the code is what it says, but the enforcement of that is almost non-existent, I think, as far at least as, as far as I know. Uh, carpenter tile has to be securely attached. Openings in the floor, like some kind of a grate or something, can't be more than half an inch wide. So you have to make sure that if you've got any kind of a grate or something that you're got some kind of a special effect under the floor, that it doesn't have, uh, that, the, that the, the holes in that are not bigger than uh, an inch wide, half an inch wide. Um, and if you've got in changes of elevation are really tough too, you can only do about a quarter of an inch. So if, you, if you've got a floor that's flat and you're trying to, you know, trying to ramp that up, even a piece of quarter inch plywood, the lip of a piece of quarter inch plywood down onto the, the, the floor is, is, is that's about as much as you can do and get away with it. Um, you can do a half an inch if it's beveled, if, if you've got the, um, that, that thickness has got a, a slope to it. Uh, but a quarter inch is about is all you're allowed really to, to have a floor change, elevation change without having some kind of beveled edge or ramp to cover it. Um, you know, sometimes even, even carpet or, a threshold um, definitely could be more than a quarter of an inch, so that that's why most most thresholds have got a sloped edge to them on both sides, and that that's to and hopefully they're less than a half of an inch. Turning space, you know, there's a lot of talk about you know how um, space, especially in a bathroom or uh, uh, especially a small single toilet bathroom, you know, when the wheelchair gets in there, how does he turn around and get back out? Um, and the the easiest way to do is just to draw. Uh, you know, five foot diameter circle and say, you know, as long as you, as long as that circle is clear, it can even swing in underneath the sink if it needs to, then that that's considered acceptable for them to be able to turn around in. There is this T-shaped uh, space that uh, is also, um, is another option if you, if you can't get the circle in there. Um, but this, but the, the, this T thing actually takes up more space than the circle does. Um, so the circle is, is probably your best way to, to do that. And, and again, your, your doors can swing into this, into the turning space, uh, especially a handicapped door. It's like, a, it's like in a stall. Um, and, uh, and you can swing, uh, the, the circle can go or the, or the, uh, the T shape, the turning space can go underneath the sink or underneath, you know, a changing table or something like that you could have in there. Uh, and it's all right for that to swing in underneath. Um, protrusions. I, I thought this was interesting. In that you know, go through haunted houses a lot, and they've got they've got stuff bolted to the wall a lot. If there's a place where you're walking down the hallway, and then all of a sudden there's something attached to the wall, it can't stick out into the hallway any more than four inches, uh, unless it goes all the way to the floor. If it goes all the way to the floor, you can you can you can stick you can, it can stick out into the hallway more. And again, that's for somebody with a cane. So that they're, you know, trying to make sure that they're not running into stuff. Um, they'll, if if it's, uh, and they're they're saying that if it's raised up off on the up off the floor, they can't feel the base of that as they're sweeping with a cane. So they're trying to, so you you can't cut, have anything stick out further than four inches on the wall, you know, kind of at arm or shoulder level, um, uh, if it if it doesn't go to the floor. So um, and then if if there's any kind of obstruction overhead, uh, you've got to it's got to be six eight clear. So um, any kind of a, a beam or, um, you know, the staircase that, that's coming down, and at, you know, that you're, if you're going down um, a flight of stairs and you're turning around and going back down underneath that for the first flight, uh, you, you need to have a six foot eight clear 80 inches uh, to be able to, to do that. Uh, there's a lot of places. I was, I was at a convention. Uh, I was at a convention center a couple of weekends ago and there was this staircase and I'm walking down the staircase and it's just like, wow, this is really low. And I'm looking at it. And they had actually cut a chunk of an I beam out of uh, out of the way so that the staircase could clear because it was too close. It's just like wow, somebody, some architect needs to be fired someplace because because that was a really ugly cut. And and you know you're damaging. I mean that beam is sized that big for a reason. It's holding something up. You can't just come in and cut a four inch chunk out of it um, just because somebody you can't clear your head on it. They really screwed up when somebody designed that. Um, it's pretty ugly too. So, uh, and this is stuff that you know, it, this would be stuff something outside, some kind of signage or something that you put outside. Uh, it's got the maximum distance for putting something on a pole. You're much better at putting, you know, instead of just putting a single thing on a pole, putting putting it on two pieces of of, uh, 
of, of posts or something that's sticking in the ground. Um, that way you're not clipping somebody. If somebody's walking by, you know, again, sweeping with a cane, they, and they, they, they might be able to clip themselves off of that, that 12 inch, um, uh, sign that's coming off the side of the pole. You're much better off for, at least for somebody that's blind and using a cane to have, uh, a, a, some kind of structure that comes down on both sides of that sign. You know, and this would come into, um, into play with some kind of a, uh, a ticket booth of some kind. Um, you know, maybe, you know, if you had an, an automatic system where, where you know, like at an amusement park where you're going and getting, you know, your tickets out of an ATM kind of thing, um, it, 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 the, that's going to be covered by ADA is, the, is that accessibility. Well, can they reach that by rolling up to it and using it? Um, and so you need to be aware of that. And, and in, in the case of a, a ticket window or something, you also need to have, if, if it's got something that sticks out, I mean, the, this, this could be a situation for a ticket window. You'd have to have, you know, even if it was, even if the, the plat, the, the table was inside the wall, you know, having that area where he could reach and, and put his money or credit card uh, on the table is, is, has got to be within that window. And if there's something, you know, if, if there's a, a, you know, if you're, you're trying to be convenient and put a table on the outside to help the guy out, you got to make sure that uh, that there's room for uh, uh, for them to be able to reach and and to give you the money through the window and that kind of thing. Um, so again, hopefully that maybe this is built into the building, but it's something you need to be aware of is make sure that that you know and, and grab a wheelchair. You know, we we used to do this a lot and when we were doing the haunt is uh, you know, grab a wheelchair and get in it and roll around to make sure you can get through to all places in the haunt. Um, that would be good for this, this kind of thing. Make sure your ticket window is accessible. Uh, there's a lot of talk about how wide uh, the, the pathway can be for, for a wheelchair. Um, and I always thought it was 42 clear, but according to this, it's actually 36 inches clear. You can actually have a long hallway that's only 36 inches, inches wide clear. It's got to be clear. It can't be having, you know, stuff on the walls or, or you know, Wayne's coating or anything that sticks out into the pathway. It's got to be the clear minimum has got to be 36 inches. But that and that number can even drop down narrower to 32 inches for a short period. So for 24 inches, you can have a a path that's only uh, 32 inches clear as long as there's not another one of those bump outs, you know, in the next four feet. Um, so so there's one of the things you need to think about when you're talking about code. You know, read the code, but always look down low below that for the exemptions, because a lot of times there's exemptions, you know, sometimes they realize that the, the code doesn't really make sense for everything. And so that they'll put exemptions in for you so that you can, uh, and, and the exemptions help a lot. So make sure that when you're doing it to, to look, to look at the exemptions and see if there's something that, that doesn't help you out with that. You know, and this is a perfect example of a, of a U-turn in a, in a square grid hallway. Um, if the, if the, the hallways are less than 48 inches apart, in other words, there's, there's, you know, you're not doing a right turn and then going four feet and then doing another right turn to do this, this U-turn in, in the hallway. If you're going around the end of a panel, like is very typical in haunted houses, you've got to have 48 inches clear off the end of, uh, of the panel between the two pathways to the wall. So you got to make sure that that's clear. And then, uh, and then the exemption for that is if you, if you've got a, a narrower hallway or you can, as long as you've got five feet off the end of that, that panel, now you've got, you can, you can narrow down that, that hallway. So you can go back to that 36 inches clear, um, and still be able to make that turn as long as there's five feet off the end of the, of that panel. And again, if, it, if, if that, if that panel is, uh, is a box, it's, it's a four foot wide, you know, actor, uh, scare box or something. Then you don't have to worry about any of this. You can be 36 all the way around. Uh, it's only when they're doing a, a very tight U-turn that, that this this falls into to uh, anything. And doorways, there, there's a lot of uh, of codes about you know a, a door. Um, you know if you're if if the if the approach to the door is straight onto the door and it's a, and it's a push door with no latch or even panic hardware, um, then you can line. Uh, you don't have to have any kind of width available. I mean, it could be a very narrow corridor to the door, but if that's a, if it's a, um, a door that requires a, uh, a doorknob to turn, then you've got to have like 12 inches to the, on the doorknob side so that the guy can kind of be off center so he can reach the doorknob and, and open it up. Um, you know, and, and if the pro, if you're pulling the door to you, you got to have 18 inches on the side. So there's a lot of little quirks with, with doorways um, that hopefully, uh, I mean, it doesn't really make sense 
Um, it's very difficult code-wise to have a, a, an actual moving door in the inside of your haunted house. Uh, but realize if you do do that for some reason, there is there are some uh, requirements for how how much space you have at that door uh, to be able to open it up. Uh, I mean, this one down here, that this hinge approach pull side door is um, is a you know you've got to have 40 54 inch wide hallway minimum 40 54 inch wide hallway plus 42 inches past the door to be able to come up to that. So those are the kind of things that could bite you if you weren't really paying attention um, and being in um, and looking at your looking at your uh, at the code before you build. This podcast episode sponsored by Scarlet Badges. We always were looking for ideas to to get those actors to take it to the next level. I really want to do something that they can use more than just a meal or they can use more than just a that a boy that a girl. They love this stuff, but it's not really promoting the haunter. And then I sit down, Scarab Badges comes out. That's when I realized this is amazing because not only is it giving them an attaboy, but it's also promoting them all year round. And for to promote somebody, to give somebody accolades all year round and have them be able to wear it on their shoulder with pride means a lot. This right here says this is who nailed it on this day in this year for the rest of their life, for the rest of their haunting life. And that's what I really love about this product is you're able to give haunting to somebody an attaboy 365 days a year. And that's, so hats off to you guys. I think this is a great product and I wish you the best of luck because it's awesome. Get your scare badges at scarebadges.com. Ramps are required to have a slope that is not steeper than one in 12. So that's one inch for every 12 inches or one inch per foot. So a 30 inch change in elevation. If you've got, you've got some kind of a, a dock or some kind of a, a, where you're trying to ramp up to, you know, a, a, from out, from the outside to the inside because the floor is 30 inches off the ground. That ramp is 30 feet long. That is massive. You know, there, there's a lot of people that try to build haunted houses in, in, uh, um, uh, truck uh, trailers, semi trailers, and that that's about that's at least 48 inches, if not five feet off the floor. That's a long ramp. That's a really long ramp. And there are some exemptions to the slope when you when you don't have room. If you're in the middle of a building and you had a slight elevation, and you need if it's a three inch elevation, you got to have 36 inches to to uh, to to be able to to make that that ramp handicap accessible. They will allow you to increase that ramp. But only for like a three or six inch um, incline or change in elevation. And the incline, they, they let you change it, but they don't let you change it much. So um, you, they do give you a little bit of leeway in that. Um, but if you're ever thinking about trying to you know, ramp somebody up to, a, uh, to any kind of height at all, you're really better off trying to, trying to do something with a chair lift or some kind of elevator um, rather than, I mean, that, that ramp is massive. Uh, there's not really any much of anything you can do with it. And, and once you get past that 30 feet, you can't, you can't have a ramp that's longer than 30 feet long. That's the maximum for one ramp run. So once you hit 30 feet, now you've got to have a, a five foot long landing before you can go up another, you know, another ramp run for however long you need it, need it to be. Um, so, you know, it doesn't take long for this thing to get really, really, you know, long a lot of construction and, 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 and kind of a mess when you're trying to do when you're trying to ramp somebody up to a different level the um, um, you have to have a landing at the top and the bottom and if the ramp turns a corner or does a u-turn you've got to have a 60 by 60 clear uh, space for the for the wheelchair to, to turn around and go the other direction if he decides to so you know thinking about trying to get up five feet you know you're talking about a massive massive ramp um trying to do all that and it's long straight it's not like you can scare people on it because it's a ramp um so it kind of becomes a mess um uh even though you know typically a, a stairway is not you know handicap or wheelchair accessible it still has to be handicap accessible because there are some people with canes or clutch or crutches or other things that would would have trouble that don't have a trouble going up and down stairs, but they need they need some help. Um, this you know, the, really the majority of the stuff with stairways is talking about handrail stuff, uh, but there is a, a, a maximum riser of seven inches uh, and a, a minimum of four, uh, and then the tread has got to be at least eleven inches. Um, be more than that, but it's got to be at least 11. Uh, and then the the handrail is what they really are are particular about. Um, 34 inches off the off the the nose of the staircase uh, of a stair tread, or a um, uh, or off the the surface of a, a ramp, or or even if you've got a if you've got a handrail and on just on a flat hallway, 
flat walkway, you've got to have this is about the, it's the same as well. Uh, and the handrail has to be continuous. It can't start. Or it can't stop. So in a situation where, you know, like the if you've ever been in a, in a hotel um, stair uh, tower, you'll notice that 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 inside the handrail on the inside of that staircase never stops. It'll go from all from the ground all the way to the fourth floor without ever being interrupted. Um, because uh, and that's because of this code. The the handrails that are on the outside that are going the further distance around, they don't have to wrap. They only have to go what 12 inches past the the end of the the, the steps at the end. Uh, they have to uh, extend out at least 12 inches at the top. And at least the width of the tread depth at the bottom, which is at least 11 inches. So you're really looking at, you know, at, at extending those um, uh, the, the the rails, you know, at least 11 to 12 inches past uh, the end of the staircase. Um, and I've always seen that in the in the past when I've seen this, uh, when you got to this point, they ran that 12 inches out flat. So I was surprised to see this slope because the idea is when if somebody that's that's that that's sight impaired or something is coming down the ramp and he feels the flat uh, handrail go out and he knows that's the last step. Um, so I was kind of surprised to see this. I'm not sure um, uh, if, if that's correct or not, but at least that was what was in the code book. So, so I don't know. Um, any ramp that's, that has a rise greater than six inches needs to have handrails on both sides of the, of the walkway. So when you're ramping something up for some kind of an effect under the floor, Try not to do it more than six inches uh, so that you don't have to do deal with handrails and that kind of stuff. Uh, there's a lot of code about how big around the handrail can be, how far off the wall it can be. Um, yeah, this is what I more than what I was talking about is you come down the slope that at the bottom it should flatten out for those for that 12 inches um, so that the person that's walking knows that that's a uh, sight impaired person walking knows that that's the end of the ramp. Um, and then when I was doing this seminar, I was um, I got all the way to the end, and then I realized that I hadn't said anything about elevator. And so I went back in and looked around to see what the story on the elevator is. And in a new building, a brand new building that's that's being built, basically an elevator is required. You know, if it's if it's more than one story, it's going to be required to be an to have an elevator. And in something that you're renovating, so some building that you're moving into that's already existing, as long as they're as long as it's less than three stories tall and has le and is less than 3,000 square foot per story, then you're not required to have an elevator. Now, if you're if you're more than if the building is more than three stories, or if there's you know if, the, if it's 4,000 square foot per floor, then you're going to have to put in some kind of vertical uh, accessible capability ele elevator or you know, the ramp would be <laughs> you like the ramp trying to go up the pyramid be massive, but um, I guess you could do that. But the uh, uh, but an elevator, you know, is one of those sticklers. And if you're in, a, just know that if you're trying to go into a building that's four stories and it doesn't elevate have an elevator, you're not going to be able to to pass ADA code. Um, or if the if it's uh, even even two stories and has more than 3,000 square feet, then you're not going to be able to use this exemption. Um, and there's some other exemptions on on some other types of buildings that it's even even if these things were the case, you're not allowed allowed to be able to do. So I hope that wasn't too dry and that uh, everybody is not asleep. Um, we can open this up for questions. I mean, if anybody has questions or if there's anything I missed, there's certainly possible it's something that I could have uh, could have overlooked that we can talk about. Um, but uh, that's kind of it in a nutshell or whatever you call it. Well, um, that was good. That was quite informative. But I do have a couple of questions and we got a couple from our uh, from our team. Um, lighting on the floor, if it's not a continuous light, is there a distant requirement between lighting segments that is needed? Like, do, do they have to be every six inches apart, every three feet, every... No, and, and that, I added that in there because it was in the old presentation, and, and that was really more of a suggestion for me than it is code. The, yeah. And interestingly, I have, I, I've been a uh, an expert witness on several lawsuits for People that have fallen down in haunted houses, I'm, I'm always on the haunted house side. I never take the, I never take ones that they ask me to be the plaintiff. So I'm always on the defendant side. But but um, and you know, one of their big one of the big complaints that I had one recently was was that the 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 floor was not lit well enough for me to see what was going on. And I've I've looked in the in the building and the fire code, and there is there the, the there is no requirement for you to light the floor at all. Period unless there's an emergency. If there's an emergency, the emergency lights come on, then it has to be lit to one lumen, which is not much. But, you know, if when the thing is in operation, it, you know, when you're just going about your normal daily business of, of 
doing what you're doing, it is not required to be lit at all. And I've looked, I've looked everywhere because I've had them tell me that there was a requirement for that. It's like, uh, show it to me because I can't find it. Yeah. Okay. So really, that's uh, the suggestion for me. And I'm always, I, I, you know, if you paint your floor black, it's going to show your, slow your crowd down. It's going to slow your, it's going to decrease your capacity. You paint the thing white and put some light on it, and it's going to increase people. People are going to move through it faster because they can see what they're stepping on. Okay. So that's, you know, you can paint a floor, you paint the floor gray and put a black you know, splotch in the middle of it, and people will jump over it all night long because they think it's a hole. Okay. Sean has asked, uh, how does a home haunter with an outdoor maze handle their lighting and lighting the floor? Well, yeah, I mean, with you can, I mean, you can always do some kind of solar cell, you know, light fixture that and point it at the ground instead of pointing it up. Um, you know, ADA, it, ADA has to do with business, you know, and there, and all of this stuff. There's a lot of stuff that are about, you know, in some cases they they give you some slack for for uh, employees, but but you know, all businesses are supposed to be ADA accessible for people to work there as well, not just go through, but also as employees. Um, but as far as a home hunt goes, I would be, I don't think that they would fall underneath the code. As long as you're not, I mean, if you're a home hunt, don't charge. You have, you can take, you can put a, you can put a, uh, uh, a donation, you know, can at the end of the haunt, but you can't charge. As soon as you start charging people to go through, if they have to pay money to go in, even if it's a donation, but they're doing it to go in, then now you're a business. And if you're a business, then you can, then the city can come down on you. They can shut you off because you're doing business in a residential zone. And okay. that's the easiest way for people to shut you down is, is zoning, is zoning infraction. You know, all, all it takes is one person to complain, you're zoned wrong. You know, you're doing a business as a residential, they'll, they'll shut you down immediately. And it's okay. been done many, many times. But um, unfortunately, I'm sure it has. Yeah. So the, the donation jar, you put your grandmother at the, at the back door. You know, saying my grandson does all this work, you should pay some money. And I mean, try to do it that way. But if you, so you can't really charge legally charge tickets, uh, charge an admission to go into the haunt. Yeah. So but that I, was I, one I, of my I, questions: is does this does a home haunter is a home haunter required to apply or comply? Uh, and basically, it's whether if you're charging even by donation, then it's um, then you need to comply. No. Um, no. I mean, if if you're if you're charging donations going in, you're illegal. So you don't have to, you're, if you're going to be illegal, be illegal. But I mean, you, <laughs> you, you should, I mean, the big, with a home haunt, make sure that your electrical is all protected. You know, make sure it's ground faulted, make sure you're there, that, that there's nothing near, you know, do everything in led so that nothing gets hot, you know, do everything you can to make sure that there's not anything flammable anywhere near the haunt. Don't build your walls out of visqueen. This queen is highly flammable. It's made out of gasoline anyway. And it, you know, when, if it burns, not only puts off a toxic gas, but it drips flaming napalm on you. So, you know, use, use, non, use non-flammable cloth, you know, plywood with some intimescent paint in it, or even just really good, you know, good coat of latex will, will bring down the flame, the flame ability of a, of a piece of plywood. But, you know, just make sure that everything in the haunted house is non-flammable, which is code, and that, you know, you really, you know, don't run extension cords across the ground, run them up over the top. Make sure that, you know, that there's no, you're using giant extension cords. If you're going to use, you shouldn't use extension cords at all, but if you're going to use them, they have to be, you know, very heavy duty, you know, 12, three or, or something bigger to make sure that you're not overloading anything so that nothing gets hot. Um, and then you really kind of, you know, it's really considered a, a Dec- home decoration and you know you're really just having a party and there's not a lot other than noise violation there's not a lot that the city can do to shut you down i mean they can you know puff and and you know threaten you but there really isn't anything that the, the city can do to shut down a home haunt as long as they're not disturbing the neighbor but yeah. as soon as there's as soon as there's cars backed up you know and, you know people too, too many people there and nobody can get through a fire engine can't get in if there's a problem or ambulance can't get in once that happens then, you know, somebody's going to, you know, kind of put their foot down and say, you need to stop doing this. So, and that's when a lot of people that are home hunters go pro. I mean, you know, haunting is a disease it's, it, and it's terminal. There is no cure. So, you know, a guy's been, somebody's been, or a family's been doing a Halloween event at their, at their house for years. And, you know, eventually somebody, you know, the spouse, um, husband or wife says, this isn't happening at my house again. And, and then the haunter has a choice of either, stopping cold turkey or going pro and 
you know, the, in my opinion, the, the home hunter segment of the industry is really just the minor leagues because a lot of those people step into the pro ranks eventually. Yep, many have. Okay, we've got uh, another question from uh, Steve. Um, squeeze hallways, as much as we hate them, uh, some of us do. Um, a lot of people are using them. What are the rules around those? Does there need to be an alternate route around them? Well, it, the way to do that would be to just put your fans on a switch. You know, if you've got an on-off switch at one end of your at the entrance to the tunnel, and um, you could turn, it's you know, reverse would even be better. I mean, if you could reverse and suck the air out, it would be faster. But you could just turn the fans off, and they'll and they'll die down pretty quickly. Um, you know, you, that's one of those things where you know a good staff sees this guy going in with in a wheelchair. You know, runs out, runs over to that position and makes sure that he's ready and can turn it on. Maybe a group or two ahead of that, even to to get it, let it go down before the wheelchair goes through. Or have his buddies, you know, the, whoever's with the guy with the wheelchair, go through it first and kind of push the bags out of the way. You make sure that you know when they're deflated, they're they're on the wall and not on the floor, so you're not it's not a trip hazard. Um, but yeah, you, you could always you can always do you know we. I said we talked about handicap bypass and we didn't really. You know the the concept is that that there's that you know if you if you keep in somebody from being able to experience a spinning tunnel claustrophobia hallway if you're if you're not letting you if you're bypassing them and not allowing them to see that that experience like take have that experience then um then you're against code so you really have to be able to you know if if you're you know if you have the opportunity you know and before they pour the floor and you're doing if you know you're doing a spinning tunnel and then, then and drop a section of that floor so you can set the tunnel down in the floor so there's no ramp or stairs to get up to it. You know, if you've got um, you know, some kind of gag or, or something that you're that you're needing to to uh, that that is keeping a wheelchair from going through for whatever reason, you know, maybe you got to rethink it and do something different um, because that's because that could be an issue. Okay. I just want to pause for a moment and thank Philip from the Haunted Attraction Network you guys listen to this podcast you'll love everything that philip is doing over at the haunted attraction network that's hauntedattractionnetwork.com there's weekly podcasts philip also does the seasonal entertainment source magazine that is free to subscribe to yes it is a real magazine to your mailbox him and scott swinson also do green tagged if you're subscribed to the haunted attraction network feed then you will get it in your podcast player so go on check out everything the haunted attraction network has to offer and make sure to sign up for their email newsletter at hauntedattractionnetwork.com slash newsletter. Uh, Michelle, uh, who is from Illinois, our entire haunt consists of three separate trails, all dirt, no steps, one ramp. Do I still need to be concerned, even though I specifically say not handicapped accessible? Should I be worried? I'm not sure you're, will, you're able to say not, not I mean, I, I wouldn't advertise that. If somebody asks, I, you would tell them. But um, you know, if you're if you're selling tickets, if this is a pro haunt and you're selling tickets for people to to go through, it's supposed to be accessible. The dirt is not an accessible surface, so they let you get by with that. But I'm not sure if you were in a in a place where you know it was so steep that you needed stairs. I'm not sure whether that would fly. And again. You know the the number of haunted the, the number of of um, wheelchair bound people that go through a haunted house is like nothing. I mean, you might get one, two, maybe a season, if that, um, because they know there's a, there's situations where they they just can't go through, so they don't come. But you know, if somebody wants to be a jerk about it, they certainly could come and call and, and pitch a fit because you're not accessible. Uh, and again, you know, it's not just, you know, they're, they're not just going to shut the haunted house down, say you're in violation of building code or fire code and you can't open, you know, there are fines involved and there you can, you can be sued for it. So you got to be careful, build a haunt, build a little um, concrete floored pavilion on your property that you can rent out for parties and picnics for the rest of the year and put the haunted house in it in October and bring that, bring that haunt out of the woods and bring it inside. Uh, one of the questions that I had, um, we're talking about accessibility uh, in regards to toilets. What about using porta potties? Is there a specific requirement and do they have accessible yeah. porta potties? You've never seen a, uh, an ADA toilet? I or have not. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they have okay. them. And you're going to have to have one. Okay. Uh, at least, you know, and, and if you if you split up your toilets and you have male toilets over here, female toilets over here, you're going to have to have two. You probably would get by with one if you, if it's all in one spot where, you know, whoever wanted to go, whoever goes in them goes in them. But um, 
But if you had, if you separate your toilets between male and female, you're going to have to, you're going to have to have at least okay. two. Okay. Um, Sean mentions I'm trying to get better at home haunt maze. How many feet should I set for emergency exits? You mean how many feet between the doors? Yeah, I believe that is what Sean is. That's uh, is that's really for. kind of a misnomer. The the code says that in a and this is building code and fire code. It has nothing to do with ADA, but the building code says that if you're in a sprinkled building, no matter where you are in a sprinkled building, you have 250 lineal feet to be all the way outside. In a in a non-sprinkled building, it's like 170. So when you design your attraction, once once you've got it drawn up, you look at it and pick the furthest part from an exit and measure that lineal pathway. And if it's longer than you're allowed by code, then you got to change something. And the easiest way to do that and something that I've always done is, is you leave a four foot egress corridor around the perimeter of the space, you know, and, and if it's a long skinny space or it's a very small space, it, it, you don't have to do that. But, you know, in a 4,000 square foot haunt, you leave four foot clear around the entire attraction. And then you build the, the, the haunt, the pathway. It's not a maze. It's not people call Call it a maze. It's not a maze. And the code, the rules change when you call it a maze. So stop calling it a maze. It's just a long twisting pathway that widens periodically for into rooms as it goes on. You can go forward and backward. There's no choice of direction. There's no dead ends. It's not a maze. So you, and you just have, and, and that way you can set the attraction inside that four foot barrier and then have multiple exits that dump out into that space. And I try to put about 50 feet between those interior exits. So every every 50 lineal feet of walking through the haunted house, there will be a an emergency exit that dumps out into that egress corridor. And then, you know, you're within 20, you should be within 25 feet of that. You've got another 125 or whatever to get all the way out of the building. Um, so that that's the easy, you know, if you fill the entire haunt with maze, with pathway, twisty pathway, then you're going to, then it, it doesn't take very long for you to eat up that 250 lineal feet. But if you yeah. bring everything in by four feet and, and it doesn't, it, it has to be clear so that you can't put, you know, you can't pile storage or junk in there, but that doesn't mean your actors can't stay in there to, to scare people. It makes it very nice for you to substitute your actors in and out because now they've got this pathway they can go around. They don't have to walk all the way through the entire attraction to get to their spot. Um, if there's a problem or somebody gets hurt, it makes it easier for them to take them out of the, the, the attraction, uh, pathway so that they, so that they're, you know, the, the haunt can continue. Um, there's a, there's a huge number of advantages to doing it that way. Um, and, and it, it helps you out with that, with that travel distance, but the, the, num the, the distance of feet between travel, there's nothing in the code that I've ever seen that says, I mean, and there, and there may be some rule of thumb that if they're, you know, if you're X number of feet, you know, between, I mean, exits that maybe that that falls underneath that 250 lineal feet. I don't, I don't I'm not sure. I've, I've heard that stuff before, but I've never really understood what they're talking about. Okay. Now, in regards to ADA, which is national compliance, would or do certain states have tougher rules yeah. that they, people need to comply by? No. And, and that's the same way with building Farco. Building yeah. and fire code is the exact same across the United States and okay. probably in Canada. And the building code and the fire code are almost identical until recently. They, they made a bunch of changes to the building code recently that they have not adapted in the fire code. But whichever one is more strict is the one you have to do anyway, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, okay. But um, the building code is the same. The difference is enforcement. Uh, you know, I take okay. that back. The Ohio, for some reason, and I, I would love to find out why or how, but for some reason, Ohio waived the sprinkler rule for anything under... 5,000 square feet. So if you've got a, you know, 4,999 square foot haunted house in Ohio, you don't have to put a sprinkler system, which is why there's so many haunted houses in Ohio. And they put that in the code and I don't know what caused it or why they would even think of it. Um, and, but it's the only state that's like that. Uh, every other state, the code is identical. It, it's so, so close to identical that you wouldn't, couldn't tell the difference. So, uh, and the difference is the enforcement, you know, and what happens is, you know, I'm always getting these people say, oh, I've been doing this haunt for 20 years and this guy, this new guy comes in and tells me I'm doing all this stuff wrong. Well, that's exactly right. The old guy that knew you, that has been that that you know, probably dated your sister at some point, was is your buddy, and and he's he knows you're safe. He knows what you're doing. He knows that, that you're not going to hurt anybody. This new kid comes in. He, he that guy retired, and the new person that, that comes in is you know he doesn't know you from anybody. All he knows is the book, and so he's going to tell you this is what it says in the book. We've never had to do that. Before. This is what it says in the book. You have to do what's in the book. If, and if they tell you something that's in the that and that that's one another, another reason you need to read the book because you need to make sure that you know what the book says. If, if they're telling you something 
and you've read the book and they're saying and you're thinking, mm, I've never seen that in the book. Can you show me where that is in the book? Because I have never seen that. You'd be surprised how fast they back paddle. But, you know, and, and I've had that happen. I've, I there was a there was a, a fire marshal that told me that I had to have a flashlight hanging on the wall at every actor location it's just like okay i'm i'm happy to do that that's not going to cost me very much money but that's not in the code book um but then i had another um, fire marshal tell me that i had to have a a a staff person um in the front in the back of every 10 person group going through the haunted house they call you call them a pusher and a puller so they had i was supposed to have a, a staff person in between every you know for every 10 people going through the haunt i had to have two staff people and it's just like you know that's not in the, i know that's not in the code book so i and so i you know i so i got all blessed and says, well, can you show me where that is in the code book? Because I've never seen that. That's a very antiquated way to do a haunted house. Um, and it's not in the code book. Can you show me where you can you show me where that is in the code book? And he turns around and leans back and grabs this piece of paper and turns around and hand it to me. And it was a city ordinance that said, you will, for every 10 people going through, have a pusher and puller going through. This. And luckily, I hadn't signed the lease yet. So I was able to, you know, I went and talked to him before I had locked the lease in. So I was able to move really across the street, which was a different city, a different municipality that did not have a, a Sydney ordinance for haunted houses. Oh. Um, wow. Okay. One of the questions, uh, again, in my own mind, I'm not sure how many people from Canada are listening here this evening. In Canada, we don't have something, we don't have the ADA, but we've got the Abilities Canada Act, the ACA, or Accessible Canada Act, the ACA. Um and I know it's available online for us to see. Where can people find all of these ADA requirements so that they can read the book? Both well, in Canada, you can just Google it. Where exactly is it in? Uh, yeah, this. There we this are. Website. Yeah. Okay. It's just ADA.gov. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Um, Sean has another question. Should he put a handicap port a uh, port a toilet uh, in their home haunt? Um, no. You know, you're not you're not required. You know, a, a professional haunt is required. The 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 health department is going to come and tell you how many toilets they want you to have on property. So they're going to tell you how many how many you have and. And, it's, and, it, and it would be one to six at a larger event, you know, that had more than six porta johns. They're probably going to have to have two handicap uh, porta johns, you know, because it's every in the code I just read. It's every six fixtures has to be every sixth fixture has to be a, a, a accessible. So for every six toilets that you've got at your facility, you know, porta johns for every six porta johns, you're going to have to have another handicap uh, toilet. But the reality is, I mean, again, there's so few people that are wheelchair bound that go through a haunted house that it doesn't really make sense to do that. And, and you're not as a home haunt, you're not required to have toilets at all. Um, you know, as a, as a pro haunt, you're going to have, you're required to have um, toilets by the health department, but as a home haunt, you're not required. I mean, it'd be very nice for you to have some. And if you're going to have, you know, several, I, I haven't, I don't think I've ever rented a, a, a handicapped toilet. So I don't, I don't know what the cost comparison is. It can't be that much more. So you might grab one. If, if you're going to, if you're going to provide toilets, you might grab one. Yeah, they're not, yeah. not, they're not, a, they're only written for a month, so it's not a big, huge expense, but it can add up if you have like 30 of them. Yeah, it can add sure. Up. Yeah. Um, so I have a question. Um, all the haunts that you've attended in your life, how many do you think were ADA accessible? Uh, completely. You know, I, I see as many as 200. I, that's one of the things I do. And when October rolls around, my, all my haunts, all my clients are up and operational and I, I tour the countryside, uh, seeing as many haunted houses as I can. And there are quite a few of them that are not accessible. Um, you know, the, all the larger shows are, are accessible. You know, even, I mean, I went to um, Hell's Gate and they have a they have a slide. So you've got to, I don't remember, I, I'm assuming that we went upstairs to get to that slide. They, I don't think they have an elevator. So I, I would say that they're not accessible. So, I mean, you know, and even, you know, even if you're not required to have an elevator, both floors. If you have, if you're in a two-story building and you're not required to have an elevator, the second floor has to be accessible. Even if you're not, even if you don't have a way to get a wheelchair from the first floor to the second floor, the second floor still has to be accessible. So, um, uh, because you know, because it's not just it's not just wheelchairs. It's for people that are um, people that are you know handicapped and sight and hearing and you know mental disorder apparently now so it's uh it's required um for all the levels to be accessible even if you're not even if there's no vertical access but i couldn't i couldn't give you a percentage but you know it might be close to 50 50 i, I don't know i i've never really i've never really taken count but you know and some of them might be accessible without me noticing it i 
or might be inaccessible without me noticing. I've been to some haunted houses and some had some really narrow hallways. Um, you know, and I go and there's a lot of trails out there that are at least by by the letter of the law not accessible. So good that's question. Nice. That's what's nice having a flat level warehouse. It's kind of easy to yep. as long as you build everything the right width and the right height. Yep. I mean there I go to all haunted houses all over the country that don't have sprinkler systems. You know, and I know that's required. You know, possibly they've gotten it waived, but probably they're just not being required by the by their city to do it, yeah. which is fine if they're not requiring it. Go for it. But uh, but just be aware that when that guy retires and the new kid comes in and doesn't know anything, he's just going to go by the book. That's all he knows. Now, fire extinguishers, those are under building code and uh, fire code, I'm assuming. OK, correct. Uh, Sean was kind of wondering how many they should have for their home haunt. How big is it? Don't know. Well. I would imagine I would imagine two would be plenty, even in like a four thousand square foot haunt, you know, especially if it's sprinkled, or even when it's not. I've I've done I've done ten haunted houses with uh, that are four thousand square feet or bigger, and you know, four to six um, fire extinguishers is about as much as, as as much as I've ever put in, and I've never really seen a requirement for that. I mean, if it's got a sprinkler system, you know, theoretically that's what that's going to fight the fire if there's a real fire, but you know, and, and you have to make sure to put those fire extinguishers in a place that the, the, the patrons can't get to them or even see them. Because, you know, and the, and the fire code says that they're supposed to be visible to the public. But I always put them in that egress corridor, in that perimeter corridor around the outside, and make sure that the actors know where they are so that they can, you know, stop something if, if something happens. Yeah. Um, but if you put it in the hall, if you put it in the hallway with the people, somebody, some jerk's going to pull on it, pull it off the wall and shoot his friends. Oh, they over. wouldn't do that. You'd be amazed. That never <laughs> oh, expensive. I've seen, I've seen once you once you pull the trigger on that thing, it's done. You got to you have to have it re recharged, and that's yeah. not that's not cheap. Not cheap. Well, guys, you can ask for any questions. If anybody wants to come on with their mic or whatever, um, they can come on and ask questions too. We're gonna wrap it up, Leonard. Thank thanks you for the for thanks that. for the opportunity. No, there was some very interesting stuff in there, like some of the uh, um, the protrusions on the walls can't stick out more than four inches. Like that was. Uh, you know, I know if I had to lay that once. Inches. I know, I know, because we put like uh, big cushions on the wall once, you know. So that makes sense, though, because if you're, we've only had, we've had a few deaf people come to you, and we have had some blind people come, and we've had electric wheelchair or the big wheelchairs, and I was like, man, this isn't going to work, but they made yeah, it because they they look bigger than 36 inches, but they made it. So I, I had a guy go through one of my haunts with the, one of those rascal things, and when it, as he was as he was leaving, I was walking by, and there was a chunk of a panel in his wheel. I was like, yeah, thanks. We had one of the actors go with them just to make sure because there were some tight turns and probably not quite ADA, but I went in. I went. To, I went into. Uh, I looked at a haunted house to buy as a, as a fixer upper one time, and and um, the the older person had been in there with one of those wheelchairs, and the the entire all the sheetrock, the half the studs, everything was torn out at the level of that of that chair. I mean, he had just man destroyed that building with that chair. Oh. Steve has a good uh, a good question. Commercial haunt is a flashlight tour. Is that ADA compliant? Uh, there is nothing in the ADA that talks about how much the floor is lit. So sure. Okay. I mean, and if you're giving you're giving the um, the customer or group a flashlight, then right. does that remove the onus? Well, and it you know typically you only give one person per group on those things. But, yes. Um, but yeah, I mean I, I don't again there I, and I've looked for it in the in the building fire code. There's nothing in there that says anything about the floor unless until there's an emergency, which is weird. But I can't find it. So so yeah, and then there isn't there wasn't anything that I saw in the Again, that that lighting thing was really just a suggestion. I guess I need to pull that out of there. But um, it was just a suggestion on on helping people get through the thing. But uh, it's not required. I could hmm. have any light on the floor at all. So yeah, I guess that was or on the floor, or any light in the building at all for that matter. So as long as your exits are lit up, your exits have to be lit. Do they? Okay. Oh, that's what you taught me. I don't. Know. You said you that the little pin lights on the exits. I do. You're right. right. I don't use I don't use internally lit. It's not lit lights. up, but. I use externally. As long as, as, long as they can Correct. be seen in the dark. Correct. So right. Glow in the dark is well, fine. And and then I even hide them. I even make them so that if you're going the, the correct direction through the attraction that you probably wouldn't see them. But if you turn around and went the opposite direction, they'd be obvious. So that, you know, if there's an emergency, keep people going the direction they're going. And then if, they're, if they come to a position where there's a fire, they need to turn around, then that gets into an exit faster. But glow in the dark, right. a glow in the dark, a glow in the dark exit sign, I have had. Um, uh, building and fire inspectors even suggest that as a solution, but what charges it up? I mean, you got to leave the lights on in the building for 
two days before you turn the lights off for the you know for the attraction because that it's a, if it's a glow in the dark sign it's only going to glow if you charge it so you're going to have to shine a black light on it or something you know while you're closed and then turn that off for it to work i, I mean and, 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 and how know, long does it, it stay lit right if you're open for six right, hours right can it can it last that long and but again if, if that's what they want and then that, that's what they're willing to accept then Go for it. I'm all for it. All right. Well, once again, and you guys, uh, thanks for showing up and asking some good questions. Uh, this will be uh, in the Hunter's Toolbox Facebook group. If you are a Hunter's Toolbox member, you will get a recording of this in your Hunter's Toolbox. We have a private group for masters, hot masters, so you'll have the recording over there. So, uh, Daryl, any final questions for Leonard? Um, Leonard, where can we find you and all of your knowledge? Um, Which is up on the screen right behind you right now. <laughs> Just just Google me. I show up like a rash. Uh, yeah, entrepreneurs.com. There's a lot of free information there, articles about uh, triangular grid system and um, how to get started and my different different thoughts on how to scare people and how to make money in the haunted house industry. That's what, that's what we're all trying to do, right? Still trying to figure out how to make money in the haunted house industry. Yep. Yeah. Why we're here. Trying. <laughs> well, how does a haunter become a millionaire? You start with two million? Or two mil. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I think if I had a mil, I can make it work. So, yeah. So maybe just one. Though. Scrappy. Would you say you can you can scare somebody just out of Home, De- Home Depot, right? Yeah. The majority of the haunts that I build don't have a lot of rubber critters in them. If I can get to Best Buy and Radio Shack, or it used to be Radio Shack, you can do that more. But yeah, Home Depot. I mean, people hire me in August or even sometimes almost September to, to design haunts for them. So, you know, you can't you can't buy a rubber critter at that, that late in the season. So you know, so I've created a system that, that you can build an entire haunted house. So and they're actor driven. You know, you still have to have costumes and some makeup and that kind of stuff, but but they're they're more actor driven and, and I think they're more effective anyway. And for a you know first time haunter doesn't need to be spending five a grand of, you know per animation to get animatronics in there anyway. So but they do need some scare badges. Yeah, they do. Every haunt in the, in the world needs scare badges. I, Thanks I, for the I, plug. I don't even think I own a scare badge. Well, I'll hook Uh-oh. you up, Leonard. I've never worked for I've never worked for a rink that was giving them out at the time I was there. I'm I'm usually gone by the time they open, so we'll give I'm you an honorary badge. Up. It's okay. We'll give you one. Honorary. You need a pickle badge. We could do with that tri- with triangles on it. Triangle pickle badge. <laughs> I've well, offered to come up with something. I've offered to let people do a cast, a live cast on my face for for props in the past. No takers. I'm sure you can make one into a dartboard, and people would. I mean, I, people would line up for that. Probably do that at Transworld just to get a line, just get a crowd. Make the scary Frankenstein. <laughs> it would. I've been Frankenstein. We used to. I remember, yeah. When Hong Kong we used to do, I, used, I it was really it was Herman at first. So funny. I had you know, two by fours glued and screwed to the bottom of my, of these work boots. And there's one video of, of a costume ball at, tra- at, at Hong Kong when, when I was, you know, in the conga line. And all of a sudden I got really short. I, I had a double blowout. The, the two by fours, the screws popped through the, the, the soles on my shoes on, on both sides. So I had a double blowout. I went from, from six, seven or six, eight to, to six foot in two steps <laughs> because the, the two by fours went off the half of them all in just two steps. Uh, the good old days. <laughs> Use some of that gorilla glue. Yeah. <laughs> cool guys. Well, appreciate it. Let's do it again. Let's we can do code compliance if you want to do that, or we can do something more creative and fun too. That'd be that'd be fun. Yeah, let me let me make a list of things you've already done and I'll shoot it over to you. Okay. Sounds good. And Leonard, Thanks, just in case you missed the chat, uh Michelle said I just want to thank uh say thank you to Leonard and to the host as well. I oh, really appreciate this, and we'll be bringing, uh, taking a closer look since this is our build. This is our build season, so thank you very much, Leonard. Okay, my pleasure. Let's do it again. We will. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. This podcast episode sponsored by Scarit Badges. Get your Scarit Badges at ScareBadges.com. Also sponsored by Haunter's Toolbox. Take your haunt to the next level at Haunter'sToolbox.com. Thank you for listening to Haunt Topic Radio. Please leave a comment wherever you found this podcast. Each comment you leave will help spread the word to other haunters around the world. See you next time.